for today's program. The title of Noam's talk is David Hartman's Hanukkah, the confrontation between Shabbat and Hanukkah candles. Noam Tzion really needs no introduction to the vast majority of you watching today, but he deserves one. Noam was a student of Rabbi Professor David Hartman and has been a faculty member at the Institute since 1978. Noam's homemade Judaism project provides stimulating pluralistic celebration books for Shabbat, Pesach, and Hanukkah. Noam's Hanukkah book, A Different Light, is the source for some of the material in tonight's program. More than 300,000 copies of Noam's books, several of which are in my home library, are in use. By the way, Noam will be referring to sources taken from the book in his talk, and you can see them on your computer by clicking on the, right on the page where you're at and either downloading them and printing them out or reading them if you haven't already done so. Noam's latest project, a masterful trilogy on tzedakah, charity, philanthropy, zakat, and tikkun olam is available in digital form. You can find excerpts from it as well on the Shalom Hartman Institute website. Noam tells me you may email him with any questions or for educational materials, and his email address is noam.cion at gmail.com. Now, just a few ground rules for tonight's presentation. Noam will speak for about 45 minutes. We will have time for questions at the end. We encourage those of you watching online to chat among yourselves and send questions, excuse me, <clears throat> and send questions using the live chat box below the video player on which you are watching us right now. We will collect the chat through the talk and, and we will ask the questions at the end. So now, without any further ado, I would like to give you my friend, colleague and teacher, Noam Tzion. Noam, it's all yours. Shalom. Of course, this evening about David, or this day about David Hartman's Chanukah is dedicated to David Hartman. I could never call him Rabbi Professor Doctor. He was Dovi. And I could never say beyond his name, Zatzal. I don't think the notion of Zichron Sadiq Livracha, may the memory of a pious or righteous person, would have been the way David would have wanted him to be thought of. As far as David was concerned, as long as his Torah was in people's uh, minds and in their, on their lips, then David was very much alive. And I'd like to dedicate this learning to an aspect of David's Torah, which has remained Torah Shabal Peh for the most part. It's an oral Torah that was never made to the stage of a book, although it was one of his major concerns, especially in the 70s, giving several courses in the university year after year over the meaning, the philosophical and ethical and theological meaning of each one of the Jewish holidays. In fact, it's one of the marks of a modern Jewish philosopher is to do their philosophy not only on the basis of classical texts, but also on the basis of the lived experience of Jews, the way holidays have been created over time. You can see that with Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, with Franz Rosenzweig, with, uh, with uh, Joshua, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, with Hermann Cohen, with Yitz Greenberg, with Eli Schweid, and David Hartman belongs to that group of people who thought deeply about that holiday. In many ways, my legacy for David as his student has been, at least with a few of the holidays, to try to take his insights and to translate it into the kind of materials that would allow people to celebrate Shabbat and Chanukah and Pesach in that creative kind of a way. Um, I hope not only to share with you some of David's perspectives, but as you can expect, also David's prejudices. David had strong opinions. I hope you won't be insulted about his strong opinions about other people's Hanukkah. You know it's only one man's Judaism, only a covenant of Judaism. There's no claim that David's prejudices and his insights are the only source of truth. David Hartman, growing up in Brownsville, um, never had a Hanukkah that had anything to do with the Hanukkah that I grew up with. The Hanukkah I grew up with as a conservative Jew, and I think it's true for Reform Jews and many liberal Orthodox Jews in America as well, is a holiday which is about religious freedom. In fact, in a, uh, in a children's curriculum that came out of the Reform Movement, which I've quoted in the sources on page 9 and 10, they talk about how Hanukkah gave to the world the notion of religious freedom, and that, of course, is the basis of, of American political culture as well. David would have said, what are you talking about? Hanukkah has nothing to do with religious freedom. Didn't you ever read the book of Maccabees? 
So if you were to look at the sources I passed out to you on page three, you'd have a good quotation about Matityao, right? Mathathias, supposedly the person teaching religious freedom. Well, when Matityao finished speaking, a Jew who had been invited by the soldiers of Antiochus to come and to make a public sacrifice to the god Zeus in front of all of the Jewish community. And Matityahu saw that man go up and he took his sword. He was moved by zeal and anger and he ran over and he sacrificed. He slaughtered that Jew on top of the, uh, the altar to Zeus. And then he said, I'm acting as Pinchas did when Pinchas, the, the zealous priest, killed uh, Zimri and Cosby Batsur in the, in the story of uh, at Shittim. And then he decided to step into the role of Moses at the, um, uh, Moses, uh, at the golden calf and said, Mi ladunai elai, let everybody who is zealous for the Torah and stands by the covenant follow me. For that, David would have said, that's enough about religious freedom, about the individual discretion. That's not what my Hanukkah is about. Now, David's Hanukkah in Brownsville, the best I can tell was, it was a rabbinic Hanukkah, it was a home holiday, it didn't have larger value significance. But when David became moved into becoming an active Zionist, after the 67 war, when he made the decision to move to Israel, he had to face a new kind of a Hanukkah that he'd never experienced before. Not a home holiday, but rather a public holiday. It was the Hanukkah of secular Zionists. It was something you felt in the streets. I remember David right in the beginning when television was first introduced to Israel, and he came and gave a lecture about Hanukkah. He says, you know, the strangest thing. I turned on the television in the Jewish state, and I see a bunch of contemporary generals sitting around with maps doing a strategic analysis of how Judah the Maccabee at Mevo Beit Choron organized the battle against the elephants and against the Greek Syrians. He says, what kind of a Hanukkah? That's not the Hanukkah I grew up with. And yet he began to appreciate that Zionism is about moving your Judaism from the home into the public area, into the streets very much. It was about seeing a menorah or a Hanukkah on top of public buildings, even when it's not Hanukkah. It was understanding that the notion of Hanukkah as a public political holiday was in fact very loyal to the original Hanukkah that was established by the Maccabees, by the Hasmonean dynasty, by the priests who later became the high priests, and who celebrated how? They celebrated with public processions. They carried a lulav down the streets on their way to the Beit Mikdash in order to celebrate their victory. And of course, on one hand, they were carrying a lulav because a lulav was uh, the symbol of the rededication of the temple, the first dedication of the temple being by Solomon on Sukkot. It's also because Hanukkah for the Book of Maccabees was never called Hanukkah. It was called Chag HaSukkot Shebechodesh Kislev. It was called the holiday of Sukkot that came out two months later than usual in the month of Kislev because the Jews couldn't celebrate it under the Greeks. However, that, that lulav is not only a sign of a chance to make up for the lost holiday of Sukkot, but it was also the Greek symbol, Nike, right? Think of Michael Jordan's shoes, who's the goddess of victory. And so they were carrying the lulav of victory, that palm in the public, we defeated. Later on, when Christianity takes over the same symbols, they'll be marching through the same streets of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, carrying that palm branch, a sign of the victory over death through Jesus' resurrection. So David understood that this holiday for, for Zionists, secular Zionists and religious Zionists, was a public holiday. He knew that back in 1881, even before the Zionist movement began with Chibat Zion, that Rabbi Molever had suggested that Hanukkah become the holiday that both secular and religious Zionists could celebrate together. But he also paid a lot of attention to the fact that the secular Zionists who took over the culture in Israel, the public culture of Hanukkah, at least for the first 30 years of the state of Israel, they were committed to a Hanukkah that was not a neutral Hanukkah celebratable by both religious and non-religious Zionists, but that it was a secular holiday. If you take a look at uh, page eight of your sources, then what you'll see is a song that I grew up on 
the song Mi Yamalel Gvurot Yisrael, showing the Israeli Zionist secular influence on my religious conservative school. Mi Yamalel Gvurot Yisrael Otan Mi Yimnehen Bechodoy Akuma Gibor Goel Hamishma Bayami Maim Basmanaze Makabi Moshia Ufode Uvyamenu Kolam Yisrael Yitached Yakum Veigael. So the secular Zionists, using all the phrases taken from the blessings for the candle, taken from Psalm 106, turned, uh, turned the phrases that in the Psalms is, Mi yamalel gvurot Adonai, who will, who will count and who will praise the victories, the acts of heroism of God, and they immediately took out God and put on Yisrael. And instead of the Gibor being God or even the Messiah, the Gibor ultimately became the Jewish people themselves that would unite and bring the victory. So David understood that, and he understood it even stronger when you look at the song, which is still the song sung, no longer on Hanukkah, that is no longer on Yom Ha'atzma'ut as it existed before the state of Israel, right? Hanukkah was the original Yom Ha'atzma'ut, the Israeli Independence Day of secular Zionism up until the state was established. Then gradually, many of those symbols were moved over to Chag Ha'atzma'ut, including the song Anu Nos'im Lapidim, We Are Carrying Torches. So if you look at the bottom of page six in English, you'll see the following song. We are carrying torches in the dark night, the paths shine beneath our feet. Whoever has a heart that thirsts for light, let him lift his eyes and his heart to us and come along. No miracle happened for us. No cruise of oil did we find. We walked through the valley, ascended the mountain. We discovered the wellsprings, the organus, the hidden light. In us, we quarried in the stone until we bled. Let there be light. The secular Zionists took over God's role. Not God says, let there be light. The secular Zionist says, there be light. Not raise your eyes to the Hanukkah candles, raise your eyes to us. We, the Chalutzim, we are the candles. We have that organus, that Hasidic mystical notion of the inner redemptive light that God hid at the moment of creation. It's now back and it's inside of us. So raise your eyes to us. We are the light. Now, you might expect David to be quite critical of such a secularization of religious tradition. And yet, I think David had a tremendous respect for that because David understood that this is, all goes back in some ways to Ludwig Feuerbach in the 1840s in his book, The Essence of Christianity, in which he says that before human beings will be able to redeem themselves, God has to die. The death of the belief in God as the redeemer, certainly the Christian understanding that you cannot redeem yourself, only Jesus, only Jesus can redeem us. First, the belief in Jesus has to be killed, and when it's dead, then human beings will see that they have the power to redeem themselves. Translated later through Marx into socialist Zionism, it became absolutely essential for secular Zionists to deny what the ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists were saying, and that is that the miracle of Hanukkah is God saving the Maccabees because the Maccabees were so righteous that God allowed them to do a miracle that could never have been the result of a military struggle. Well, secular Zionism rejected that. And David understood that if there was a major reason for Jews abandoning orthodoxy at the turn of the 20th century, then the answer was not because of science. It wasn't a result of the inability to believe in the metaphysics of God. It wasn't the impossibility of believing that there could be a supernatural miracle. Science wasn't the problem. The problem, David said, and Zionism, I think, understood that, was that the image of the traditional Jew was an image of passivity, of delayed gratification, of akedat yitzchak, of the willingness to be a martyr, the willingness to deny your own conscience, your own reason, your own autonomy, and allow yourselves to, to sacrifice yourselves for a God and to pray that that God would bring you redemption. 
David, of course, all of his philosophy is about trying to show that there's a powerful Jewish tradition, which we'll see in Hanukkah as well, that shows that the Jews are activists in their own redemption and that they have a partnership with God in doing that. Now, for David, therefore, in order to try to build the bridge he wanted between secular and religious Zionists, in order for him to be able to speak as he often did both in secular and religious kibbutzim during the first 10 years of his coming to Israel, he needed to find some common, a common platform of which to explain his notion of religious Zionism, not Rav Cook, but a different notion of religion and nationalism coming together. And of course, for David, that was Maimonides. So if you'll take a look at your sources of Maimonides on page 12, then you'll see one of the first things I remember David teaching me about the proper reading of Maimonides. If you like, take a, take a look on page 12 at Perik Gimel, Halacha Aleph, it says, the second paragraph, Ad shirichem alehem Elohe avotenu. The Jews suffered until the God of their fathers, Hoshiam miyadam, until God saved them. And God redeemed them from the hands of the Greek Syrians who were oppressing them. And then the high priests, the Hashmonaim, were able to overcome the Greeks. The Haragum, and they killed them. And then, for no good reason, at least initially, Maimonides uses the same verb again. The Hoshiu Yisrael Miyadam. Well, tell me. Was it the Hasmoneans who saved Israel from the hands of the enemy? Or was it the God of our fathers who saved Israel from the hands of their enemies? And of course, David understands Maimonides is saying that you can't separate between God's action and human action. They go together. And at the end, and then they established a king, not the messianic king from the dynasty of David, a priestly king, but that king brought the Chazra Malchut Israel, and Israel returned to sovereignty. So you can see that David wanted a rabbinic Chanukah and a religious and secular Zionism, which didn't see Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai as the great hero. And here David had very strong negative things to say about those diaspora historians, and in this case represented, I think, very articulately by Arthur Waskow in The Jewish Renewal, but also of many, many historians that I studied under when I studied in America, who emphasized that Hanukkah is about the rabbis turning their backs on Hanukkah as an Israeli Independence Day and making it a minor holiday turning their backs on the high priests who became corrupt and making the rabbis the leadership, turning their backs on Yehuda HaMakabi, never mentioning him, and only talking about Matityahu, who was a Kohen Gadol. It was about the rejection of war. It was about the rejection of political autonomy. It was about the rejection of national honor. To which David said, that's not the rabbinic Judaism that I found in the Talmud. He says, even if you read Al-Hanisim, the prayer we say in Birkat Amazon and in, and in the services, you'll see the Nisim, the miracles they're talking about, are not about that little vessel of oil that lasted for eight days. It's about Gevurot. It's about the defeat of the, Gre the, Greek, the Greeks with God's help, of course. Hanero Talalu is also about Gevurot. It's about battle. In fact, it's true that the books of Maccabees were never canonized into the Bible that the rabbis ultimately accepted as their Bible. Unlike the Septuagint, the Greek Jews, who did, of course, include at least two of the books of the Maccabees in their Bible. And yet, very early on, there was a short summary of the battles of the Maccabees in a, book, in a sort of a Megillah called Megillat Antiochus, which continued to be part of Jewish tradition. In fact, Rav Sadji Gaon had it translated into Hebrew because he thought it had been written by Hillel and Shammai. And during the early Middle Ages, it was read on Shabbat Chanukah in the same way you would read Megillat Kohelet or Megillat Rut on other holidays. There were even some rabbis who thought you should say a bracha before reading Megillat Antiochus. So David would say, clearly he said, this is not the rabbinic 
Hanukkah doesn't have to get rid of Jewish history and Jewish political or military involvement. In fact, and I remember this shiur particularly well, David said, take a look at the very first halacha, remember? Mishnah Torah is a book of halachot, and see the first halacha about Hanukkah. We're back on page 12, we're at the very top source, and as David points out, as you'll see, this is the only halachic book from the Middle Ages that puts in the history of Hanukkah. You won't find it in the Arbat Turim of the 14th century. You won't find it in the 16th century Shulchan Aruch. They quote Maimonides all the time. <coughs> but for them, the only miracle is the miracle of the vessel of oil. So let's read the first halacha as Maimonides makes history into halacha. In the era of the second temple, the Greek kingdom issued decrees against the Jewish people, attempting to nullify their faith and refusing to allow them to observe the Torah and its commandments. The first crime is not a crime against the temple. The first crime is the crime that doesn't allow the Jews to celebrate Torah. We can see it in the book of Maccabees, preventing Jews from doing Brit Milah, preventing Jews from studying Torah preventing Jews from keeping kosher, or at least from eating pure foods. But that's only the first crime. The second crime is that the Greek Syrians extended their hands against their property and their daughters. Now, I don't imagine that you often teach Hanukkah about that, not about religious freedom, but about the dignity and the self-control of a person who can control their own house the language here should remind you, if God forbid it's happened to you, that you came home and you discovered that your bedroom had been rifled by robbers. You saw your most intimate clothes thrown all over the bedroom and people talk about feeling violated. Sometimes they'll even say it's a tenth part of what rape must feel like, both when they stick their hands in your pockets and even more so, Pashtu yadam bivnotam, when you can't even protect your own women folk in this patriarchal society from being, from being molested. We know from the medieval Midrashim, one that's found in, Beit, um, in a book called Beit, Beit Midrash, Perak Chet, put together by a, a scholar named Yelenik in the 19th century. And there there's a story about a Chana. Not the Chana of the book of Maccabees, and not the Chana who was a martyr in the Talmud, but rather a Chana who is the daughter of Matityahu. And it would seem, according to this medieval Midrash, that in those days, every single woman, Jewish woman, before she was able to marry her husband, had to be raped and deflowered by the hegemon, by the Greek king or the Greek governor in that particular area. And this woman, Hannah, Matichao's daughter, stands up at her wedding before she's about to be sent to be raped by the, the Greek uh, overlord. And she turns to the brothers, the brothers of the Hasmoneans, and said, Why aren't you like Levi and Shimon? Why don't you defend the honor of my honor and the honors of the daughters of Israel the way Shimon and Levi tried to protect and did protect Dina when they killed off the people of Shechem? And so there's a tradition here that Maimonides is picking up on, that what Hanukkah is about is not only about religious observance, it's not only about protecting the sanctity of the temple from being violated, though it's also that, but it's also the ability to protect your own personal dignity, your own personal honor. And it seems to me that that's what lies behind the fact that when Maimonides continues this halakha, and he goes on to say, the Jews suffered great difficulties from them, for they oppressed them greatly. And then they go on to the double redemption by Israel and by God that leads to public independence. It's the ability to have your own government that allows you to live a dignified life. And that was a very important category for David Hartman. And for him, as we know, it doesn't have to be the messianic king. And a messianic king for David is, after all, just pretty much a naturalist king because David Hartman's following Maimonides has no notion that the Messiah will change human nature. It won't change Jewish law. It won't mean that we don't need kings anymore. And so that kind of a king could have been the Hasmonean king as well. Now, David's Hanukkah, 
now a political Zionist Hanukkah following Maimonides, is a holiday that celebrates our particularity. But that doesn't mean for David that we are called to turn our backs in favor of particularity against the larger world. And here he did a close analysis, which we don't have time for, of the halachot of the Rambam, which are a summary of the Talmud, about pirsum hanes, about publicizing the Jewish message, publicizing it by putting it in the window, putting it next to the door, by lighting the candles, according to Maimonides, when the sun first sets, it's not even dark yet, and you're already putting symbolic candles into the window in order to teach people something. What David Hartman is saying is that Hanukkah is not about a withdrawal into a self-ghettoized Judaism or a self-ghettoized nationalist state. The Jewish people, both nationally and individually, are interested in entering into a dialogue with the public space. That's why if you light your Hanukkah candles after people have left the shuk, they're not out in the public area anymore, then it's not Hanukkah candles anymore because you're not in conversation with the public realm. Just as you might put a, on your, on your uh, shirt a button saying, I'm in favor of these political values, or you might put up a sign saying, I'm in favor of this president or some other presidential candidate on your lawn, in the same way Hanukkah candles are about the notion, the notion of having the courage to make your identity and your values public. It's not about publicizing a miracle that a little bit of oil managed to last for eight days. And here David would laugh and say, what kind of ridiculous things you find in the halacha when they're trying to figure out, do we have a right to count the first night of Hanukkah as a miracle? After all, they were lighting the first vessel of oil. That would have burned for a whole day anyway. So what's the big deal? Maybe the miracle is only on the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh and eighth day. And David said, what is that? That's not the point. The miracle is the miracle that the Jews were willing to fight, that they succeeded in fighting with God's help, and then that they publicized the values that they were able to defend and enter into a public discussion with the larger world around them. In particular, I remember David talking about the halakha that Maimonides brings here that says that if it's a time of danger, as it was under the Zoroastrian fire worshipers in the fourth and fifth century in, in the Talmudic period, in which Jews could not safely light Hanukkah candles outside, so they lit them inside. And therefore they couldn't publicize their values, but at least they could turn inwardly and strengthen their family's values. And that's the halakha, if it's a time of danger. And here David said, but those Ashkenazim, how come they still use this law in order to give them ex an excuse that in case it becomes dangerous again, we can light Hanukkah candles? It doesn't have to be in the window. It doesn't have to be during the time in which people are outside. You can light any time you want in your house as long as there's somebody to see it. And David said that's something fundamentally wrong if you don't understand that lighting Hanukkah candles is about courage. It's about the ability to stand up and to declare your identity. So the cover picture I put on the sources from my Hanukkah book is a cover picture of a menorah that was lit in 1933 and 1934 in Kiel, Germany, which was a major uh, Nazi center, after the Nazis had captured the, uh, the public space. And you can see the menorah shining into the public space, as well as the swastika, which has totally conquered the public space. Later, that rabbi, as I discovered, that rabbi who was from Romania, living in Germany, was thrown out of Germany for his anti-Nazi sermons. He left in 1935. And his Hanukkiah is in Beit Shemesh, if anybody's interested in going to visit it there. So for David Hartman, courage is a central value that Hanukkah is about. And military courage is certainly a part of that. David could never stand the kind of, again, what he saw as a pacifistic interpretation of Hanukkah, in which, for example, on page 10, if you want to look on it a little later, or page 9, there's a description of Matityahu, who lived in Jerusalem 
And according to this children's version of Hanukkah, written in 1971, he runs away from Jerusalem because the Jews were calling for war and he didn't want to fight a war, so he ran away to Modi'in. In order to teach us, says this children's book, that Hanukkah is not fought for political independence. It was only fought for religious freedom. That's its only value. And the Jews have always thought wars are stupid. It's in response to those kinds of comments that David would say that that's not just utopian and naive. What it is, it's, it's immoral. That Zionist ethics is about the fact that we need to be able to defend ourselves and that God supports that. That we have to embody higher ethical values in the reality we live in. And David was always very, very proud and at the same time very sad for his son-in-law, Arla Katz, who was one of the first uh, religious officers to reach a very high position in the Israeli Air Force and ultimately was shot down in 1982 in, during the, war, the first war in Lebanon. So for David Hartman, military courage is important, political independence is absolutely essential, but that never meant for David Hartman that he was a warmonger. It never meant for David Hartman that we should have an idolatry of Hamidina, of the state. In all the debates between Yeshayo Leibovich and David Hartman, there was never a disagreement about the danger of the idolization of the army, the idolization of the land, and the idolization, especially Ben-Gurion here, of the state. David Hartman had no problems in saying that national honor is a problem that can, that can mislead us. He was not a revisionist. He wasn't moved by wearing uniforms and having military, uh, military uh, marches on Hanukkah or on Yom HaAtzma'ut. Nor did he think that we should look for chances to be able to sacrifice ourselves, that the greater martyrdom, the greater sacrifice would be the greater thing. No. He followed Maimonides who said that if you can avoid martyrdom by accepting Muhammad as the prophet of Allah, which is another name for God, then you should do it. That you have no right to endanger your life for no good reason. In this, clearly David Hartman was following Maimonides' version of the Messianic king in Hilchot Malachim, in the Laws of Kings, in which he says explicitly, the Jews do not believe in the Messiah because they're waiting for a chance to eat and drink, nor are they waiting for a chance to lord over the nations of the world or to become an empire. They just want economic and political security so that individuals can pursue their own need for individual religious growth. So now let's come at the very end back to the theme that I chose, David's theme, the relationship between Hanukkah candles and Shabbat candles. Because at the very last of the halachot that, my, that he brings, that Maimonides brings at the end of Hilchot Hanukkah, which is also the very end of his whole book on Jewish holidays, Sefer Zmanim, Maimonides does something very typical, and that is to move at the very end from halacha to Agadah, to move from particular details of the halacha to the larger significance of the halacha. So if you will, and you take a look in the Hebrew at the bottom of page 14, the English is also there, you'll see the last halacha in the book of times. And this is a halacha that talks about the problem. You don't have enough money. You haven't got enough money to buy a Hanukkah candle and a Shabbat candle. So what do you do? And here David said, what do you think? You think this is an example of how Jewish halacha is so concerned about the poor? He says that's a total misunderstanding. It's not about sensitivity to the poor. This is about creating, if you will, an artificial value conflict so that Jews can begin to clarify between two good values, the value of Hanukkah and the value of Shabbat, and to decide what the priorities have to be because that's the nature of Zionism. That's the nature of rabbinic life. It's that you live in a world of limited possibilities, limited resources, and you have to make choices. So what's the choice that had to be made in the last of these halachot? As it's reflecting, of course, on the text in Masechet Shabbat about the same topic. And there you can see that you have Ner Hanukkah 
or Ner Shabbat? Which is more important? Now remember, David Hartman, following Maimonides, thinks that Ner Chanukah is a very important mitzvah. But he thinks that Ner Shabbat is more important. And what's the difference, as David emphasizes? Ner Chanukah stands for the public realm. It's pirsum hanes. It's the light that goes into the, the public marketplace that makes the Jews enter into the marketplace of ideas. Ner Shabbat is not about that. Ner Shabbat is private. You don't put it on the window. You don't put it outside your door. You put it near your table. The Hanukkah candle is purely symbolic. We cannot use that light for any purpose whatsoever because the whole point is to separate between the shamash, which is a candle for whatever needs we have for light, maybe reading our Hanukkah books and trying to follow the blessings, but the other candles are candles for pirsomet. They're for advertising. You need to have the shamas there just to remind you that these other candles are not to give light, they're to symbolize something. It's like the difference walking down Emek Rafaim between seeing the street lamps which are now on at, at uh, almost 8 o'clock in Jerusalem as opposed to the fluorescent signs that say wonderful things like Hamburger, uh, hamburger Bar where the point is not to give light on the street but it's to teach you that here's where we have hamburgers. Go buy them, kosher, glot. So... Hanukkah candles are about being symbolic. That's why they only have to last for three, 30 minutes. That's why they can be lit when the sun has just come down when you don't really need any light. But Shabbat candles are to be used. They're for Oneg Shabbat, for the pleasure of seeing what a beautiful table you are. They're for Shalom Bay, so you can see the faces of the people you talk to and have real communication. In the same way, Hanukkah candles and the wine for Kiddush, which is also less important than Shabbat candles, is about the divine, about God's miracle, about God's honor, about God's creation, if we're talking about the Kiddush. But Shabbat candles are for human use. They're not about God as such. God wants us to take pleasure. It's not about God's need. And therefore... When we think about Hanukkah, we have to think about the willingness to sacrifice, including to go to war and to see people die in fighting for our political independence and also, of course, our religious freedom. But Shabbat candles aren't about that. Shabbat candles, and here Maimonides in his Hilchot Shabbat, which is a section that I brought here, you can check those sources later, he says that we have to learn from Shabbat candles to reject what the Karaites teach us. For the Karaites say Shabbat is a time of asceticism. On Shabbat, you should have no Shabbat candles burning. You should have no making love on Shabbat. You should have no hot chulent. You should eat cold cuts. And if somebody's life is in danger, you should not go to the doctor. Don't call the ambulance. Don't give them treatment. Because Shabbat for the Karaites is a holiday of is a holiday which is dedicated to God's sanctity. But for Maimonides, Shabbat and Shabbat candles are a symbol of the fact that God's Torah is not about achzariut, about cruelty, it's about rachmanut, it's about mercy. It's about life, not about death. And so even in the case of where there's any threat whatsoever to human well-being, then it becomes a mitzvah for the greatest rabbis not to find women or non-Jews to save people, but to save them themselves. And last but not least is that the difference between Hanukkah candles and Shabbat candles is a different notion of the world of the gibor, of the hero. Now I'm going to read that final halakha. If one is confronted, bottom of 14, if one is confronted with the simultaneous mitzvah to light one's household lamp for Shabbat and to light the Hanukkah lamp, then the Shabbat household lamp takes precedence because it contributes to shalom bayit, to domestic peace and tranquility. After all, the divine name is also to be erased in the biblical ritual of the wife suspected by her husband of adultery, the sota, In order to facilitate making of peace between man and woman, God agreed that 
his name would be written on a curse, that then his name would be melted into the water and the woman would drink it, an awful, terrible ordeal, whose only value, since happily we're done with it, is that it teaches the principle that God is willing to be mochel al kvodo, to forfeit God's honor, God's respect for the sake of peace. Great is shalom, Maimonides adds, for the whole Torah was given to make peace in the world, not just about the Jewish people. As it says in the Bible, no personal reference to me, its ways are ways of Noam and all its paths are peace. Now, what David saw here is that Maimonides understands the importance of gevura. Military, Hanukkah heroism is about defending your daughters. It's about defending your temple. It's about defending your political independence. It's about taking unction when your honor is desecrated. But the greater gevura is hakovesh et yitzro, the person who conquers their anger, their libido, their desires. That's what marriages are built on. Not a man and a woman each demanding to get the covet they deserve to show how right they are, but rather a man and a woman who are willing to forfeit their sense of honor to forfeit whether they're right or wrong, to forfeit their anger and their pride in order to be able to live together. I remember after David taught this class that he said in a way typical of his John Deweyite pragmatism, he said, okay, so we got a halachic difference here between Hanukkah candles and Shabbat candles. Okay, so what? My nafkamina. Or as John Dewey would say, what is the cash value of this difference between two metaphysical notions that seem to be so trivial and so unprovable? And David said, well, I think the cash value would be a discussion in the Knesset, in the spirit of Maimonides' last halacha and Hanukkah. And it would be a budgetary discussion, in fact, very much like the budgetary discussions they're in the middle of right now, where the major point of the discussion is, how much can we cut the Israeli army's budget at a time in which, as Alan said earlier, we have something to worry about, certainly in the case of Iran. And David said, if we have to ask what's more important, this halakha says we better not we better not cut the budget for child allowances, the budget for parent education, the budget for social workers, the budget for teaching family values. If we cut that completely because pikuach nefesh, we have to worry about the army and the military budget, then in the end we will be undermining the deeper, more important values. It's not that we don't need military pride and military courage. We do. But we have to know that the family, ner beto, the light inside your home for your consumption, not for the public consumption, that that has to be tended, that has to be nurtured. And in fact, if I think about the fact that the book of Maccabees is about the family of Matityahu and his five sons who fought for 25 years till they finally got political and religious independence, then I would say, that we learn that the family is the basis for our military security and it grows out of the strength of the family. We all know, we all know, that if the, the Jewish family is not strong, then we won't be able to produce the kind of strong individuals necessary for leadership, uh, leadership positions in public Judaism. We know very much so that Matichao lost son after son after son, but he still had sons who still believed in the values who could go on for that final kind of victory. And so I think for me, that's, that's David's message to me, to strengthen the family. It's therefore no surprise that one of my things dedicated to David's memory has been to work on homemade Judaism and the way in which we make our Hanukkah, our Shabbat, and our Pesach into places for strengthening the storytelling, the storytelling that we need in order to be a strong and a peaceful people, but not one afraid to live in the real world. Any questions? Thank you very much, Noam. Uh, we have a question. This is from 
Julie Hilton Danan from Chico, California, about a good 10 time zones away from us. And here's, a, here's her question. So are the Chabad folks on the right track with their public lightings with giant Hanukkiot in malls and airports? Should we all be getting on board with that? Mm -hmm. David was not a big fan of Chabad. What Chabad has done, I agree, is that they've decided to take over the public space. Um, but what David was suggesting is that Hanukkah has to be a balance between the private space and the public space. If you close the, the private space or you try to self-ghettoize, then you're not following what Hanukkah is about. If you only have a Judaism which exists in the public space, but you don't have a family life and the inner values at home, that also won't work. What you need to do is you need to be able to develop a richness at home and then share that light through your window with other people and with the public realm. I think that uh, Chabad, who certainly plays an important role in terms of raising Jewish consciousness and by understanding the value of the public space, um, I wish they weren't such missionaries who had very little sense of appreciation for pluralism. For David, I think, the point of letting your light shine into the public space is not to missionize the public space. It's to send out a message of this is who I am. These are the values I witness to, to use a good Christian term. I'm an aide to that. And now I'm entering into a conversation in the public sphere about my values and your values. In fact, I'd like to end with the, um, and respond by looking at a beautiful quotation from Rav Cook, um, which I brought at the very, very end of the sources on page 21, and then we'll see if there's another question. Um, I called it the pluralist manifesto of Hanukkah, and here is where I think it departs from what I know about Chabad, at least. Everyone must know, bottom of 21, says Rav Cook, and understand that within burns a candle, and that no one's candle is like his or her fellow's candle. And no one lacks their own candle. Everyone must know and understand that it is their task to work to reveal the light of that candle in the public realm and to ignite it until it is a great flame and illuminate the whole world. So I agree with Chabad that we have to be public, but I'd like the messages we send out not to be one-sided missions, but rather to be a sharing of the multiple sources of light that we try to nurture each one in their own home. Thank you for that, Noam. And I wasn't sure that we would get through this without a question about the uh, rare convergence this year of Hanukkah with another holiday that sometimes is representative of freedom, Thanksgiving. And so we have a question from Stuart Weinblad, and he asks, what do you think about the convergence of Hanukkah and Thanksgiving in the U.S.? Is it a good idea to promote it, or should we de-emphasize it? Now you can get me in a lot of trouble if I talk too much about that, because my son, Mishael, just wrote an article about Thanksgiving and Hanukkah. I don't remember the acronym for combining it. By the way, it's on the Hartman website for those who want to read it. The one historical comment I will make, and here I think there's plenty of room for sharing between Hanukkah and uh, uh, Hanukkah and Thanksgiving is, of course, the Thanksgiving is originally Sukkot. Thanksgiving, as the Puritans who certainly knew their Bible well, is an example of celebrating the harvest festival of Sukkot, which, of course, fell in November because of the difference of seasons uh, at that time. And Hanukkah, of course, is making up for the loss of Sukkot. So in that, at least in that external way, I think it's a nice combination between the two. But in every other way, I think the values of Hanukkah and the values of, uh, of Thanksgiving are very different. What they share most is, that point that I made at the very end from David Hartman, is that Judaism and American values, they bring it, they start at home. But for Thanksgiving to succeed in generating values and for Hanukkah to generate values, we have to make sure it's not only about lighting candles, but also about learning about Hanukkah in the same way we learn about Thanksgiving. That was Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt from Potomac, Maryland. And uh, if you'll take time for one more question. This is from Dennis Linson, and it says, what was David Hartman's 
take on Jews killing Jews at Hanukkah over following secular authority or rebelling? Mm -hmm. Look, uh, David, David understood that Hanukkah is a celebration of a civil war. He understood very clearly that the great dangers of Hanukkah are that we will be like the Maccabees in the sense that it's a battle between those Jews who want to westernize and assimilate in their Judaism to a Greek Syrian tradition and those who want to try to keep it more purist and more traditional. And of course, we know that the Maccabees, when they got into power, they forcibly circumcised Jews who refused to have circumcisions. And clearly, they were not interested in religious freedom, at least for other kinds of Jews. And David was very much aware that the language of al Nisim, which talks about the pure as opposed to the impure, is a language which is extremely dangerous. It's one of the elements of Chabad's understanding of Hanukkah, which I find very difficult because it continues to emphasize the pure and the impure and the absolute opposition between the two. And so I think David would take Hanukkah as a warning to us about the dangers of how Israel can become a place of civil war precisely because we're arguing over the same public space. If our Judaism only stayed at home, then we could be different. I live in southern Jerusalem. The Haredim live in northern Jerusalem. The Arabs live in east Jerusalem. We could work it out, everybody having their own private space. But when you have a public Judaism, David understood, that with all the pride of having a public country and a state that represents your values, he knew how it was so important for the state to show self-restraint in not trying to use the state to force its values on the private space, but allow the private space to nurture and then share its values into the discussion that should happen in the public space. Thank you again, Noam. That was Rabbi Dennis Linson of Laguna Woods, California, with that previous question. Right. So I think we're about out of time. I would like to thank everybody for uh, staying with us and participating in this. I'd like to thank Noam for his terrific talk about uh, Hanukkah and Rabbi Hartman's take on it. And I want to tell you all, uh, again, I want to give you an early uh, Hanukkah Sameach and tell you that our present to you for Hanukkah will be a video recording of this lecture on our website as soon as we can manage that, perhaps within a few days, at least give me till early next week before we get this ready. So I'd like to thank you again from Jerusalem, for Noam Tzion and myself, Alan Abbey, and good night. Chagurim Sameach.